It really is my, uh, my honor and my pleasure to introduce Dr. Frank Pagani. Frank is a good friend and an esteemed colleague. He is, uh, Dr. Pagani is the surgical director of a heart transplant program and the program director for the Center of Circulatory Support at the University of Michigan. Uh, Frank's clinical focus has been in surgical therapies for advanced heart failure. Uh, I should say that around the world, Frank is highly regarded as one of the best heart failure surgeons, uh, not only for what he does, but for how he thinks. He has been an integral part of the uh, HeartMate 2, HeartMate 3 programs, uh, not only as a big enroller, but, but also in the design of the trials and in the analysis of the data. Uh, Frank has also been uh, very actively and intimately involved in uh, Intermax, uh, and uh, has contributed tremendously uh, in uh, that regard. So we're very honored to have Dr. Pagani join us today for the summit, and he'll be speaking on the surgical interventions in advanced heart failure. So I ask you to welcome Dr. Pagani. It's very kind of you, uh, Tom, and I just want to thank Doctors uh, McGillivray, Mimiraj, and, and Dr. Park for the invitation to uh, come here today and visit with everyone. It's been a while since I've been down to Houston to visit, and it's just always a pleasure to get to come down. I'm going to talk today about there's so many topics in uh, surgical therapies for a heart failure, and a lot of it was uh, approached this morning in terms of interventional therapies uh, that are some, changing the paradigm of some of the surgical approaches to heart failure. I'm going to focus a little bit on um, a bit on heart transplantation and, and uh, left ventricular assist devices. And it's, it's amazing within the past one year, some of the profound changes that are coming along. No, no, no disclosures. I think it's gonna, it represents uh, a new era, new opportunities, certainly new challenges, and new paradigms in how, in how we uh, are gonna approach transplant and, and LVAT therapy. Now, if, if I were to ask the audience what, what, what the feeling or perception of transplant is, and I think most patients would, people would raise their hand and say that transplant has been stagnant. There's been no growth. It's the same immunosuppression the last two decades, the same volume of transplants. And uh, one of the more amazing things about it is that increment, there's been significant incremental uh, improvements in heart transplant survival. So now the median survival of patients transplanted in the era of 2002 to 2008 now exceeds 12 years. And no other therapy uh, in advanced heart failure uh, even comes close to achieving that survival benefit than, than heart transplantation. Although it's been deemed epidemiologically trivial because of the small numbers relative to the large number of patients who might benefit from this, it still has profound effects for patients who receive heart transplantation. Now, it's amazing when we look at this slide that, uh, again, when we look at the numbers, I myself personally thought that this was, was, was inaccurate, but really, there has been a dramatic increase in uh, heart transplantations over the past decade. And some of this may be account that there's been a change in the population. There's been about a 10% increase in the population in the United States, about from 300 million patient, people to about 330 million uh, people, but that doesn't necessarily account for some of the increase in uh, heart transplantation. Now, unfortunately, as we'll see, some of this is, you know, as it's, it's a unfortunate reality that, but that said the causes of death, but uh, if you look at the next slide, we could see that uh, the epidemic that we've had in drug overdoses has really contributed to this, this major increase in heart transplant donors. If you look at um, just this purple line here represents the increase in deaths due to drug intoxication. And there's a profound increase in deaths due to drug intoxication over the past decade. And if you look down here as um, the uh, number of, or the percentage of drug intoxication of, of all patients who've donated organs, you can see that in the year 2000, it was 
re representing roughly 1%, and now up to roughly 13% of all donors, so a profound increase uh, in number of donors. But that has not, um, the fortunate thing about the drug and do uh, donor dr um, overdose is that the outcomes with that population of patients uh, or donors is, is actually quite good. So it hasn't had an impact, uh, adverse impact on heart transplant survival. And these were data that were just recently published by, um, in, by the Brigham Group uh, in, uh, and also the ISHRT uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine this past year. But how long will the rise in drug intoxication deaths continue? And there's been very uh, strong efforts uh, in many states to regulate how, we pr how providers prescribe um, uh, opioids, and that's going to obviously have a, a favorable impact on drug overdoses in, in the coming years. And so that's going to have an adverse effect on donations uh, for heart transplants. So there has to be what alternative paradigms to increase the donor heart pool. And there's a number of things that potentially have had been reported this year that could profoundly affect uh, the number of donors that might be available. One, uh, hepatitis C has traditionally been a barrier. Uh, a donor with hepatitis C has traditionally been a barrier to heart transplantation. We would not uh, take a donor who, who is hepatitis C positive and put it into a recipient who is hepatitis C negative because we potential the risk of transmitting that disease to a, a, a transplant recipient. Well, um, that um, fortunately is no longer represents a potential barrier uh, to heart transplantation. And the group at Vanderbilt, and uh, in, in the largest uh, series of patients, have reported on the outcomes of patients uh, utilizing uh, transplant recipients who are hepatitis C negative, who went on to receive hepatitis C hearts from, from donors. And what they demonstrated was that in 13 patients, um, nine of those 13 patients, or 69% of those patients, uh, had a serial conversion so that the, the recipient uh, actually had what became uh, had a viral load and actually was, the infection was transmitted to those recipients. Uh, in four cases, uh, there actually was no serial conversion. And it's likely that some of these cases represents false positive on PCR testing, and because as two of those patients had NAT or nucleic acid testing negative, so they were likely did not have hepatitis C. But in the majority of cases, there was actually viral conversion in the recipient. These patients, uh, these patients then went on to receive direct-acting antiviral agents specific for either genotype 1 or genotype 3 um, uh, uh, hepatitis C. And all, all nine patients um, that were seropositive converted, and, and the, the hepatitis C was eradicated in all those patients. So that represents a profound change in uh, treating um, the potential uh, hepatitis C recipient in that uh, um, they're, all, they're all basically uh, cured from the hepatitis C that they received from the donor. And this represents you know, a, a fair amount of patients or donors in the United States, roughly could it potentially increase the donor pool by, by as much as 5%. The long-term outcomes will still need to be determined whether this has any effect on long-term survival, but this is an encouraging observation from um, from the, uh, in terms of uh, recruiting more donors for heart transplantation. Now, another area that um, was, has been traditionally uh, an area of research and not thought to be a practical area is that of xenotransplantation. And as, as, as Dr. Shumway once characteristically said, that xenotransplantation is the future of transplantation and always will be. But there has been a number of uh, encouraging reports uh, this year, um, particularly one in Nature that, uh, that has received a, quite a bit of attention. And, and this uh, group in Germany uh, presented uh, their results, the latest results, of a, um, utilizing a um, genetic modified pig and transplanted it into a baboon 
uh, simulating a human, uh, human uh, heart transplantation. And this has uh, typically been done before, but, but the results that these investigators have achieved with this is actually pretty outstanding. And they did a number of innovative, um, innovative things to improve the survival. First, um, in previous animal models, uh, to, test the, um, to test the viability of a xenotransplant in a baboon, most of those models used a heterotopic model, meaning the, the heart from the pig was transplanted into the abdomen or aorta of the uh, baboon. And so it really didn't have to function. They just looked at viability, but not ne necessarily functional activity. And they were able to demonstrate uh, in that type of animal model that most of those grafts can survive for about two months. But none, of those, but none of those experiments really demonstrated that the heart was able to beat and, and provide a contraction strong enough to support circulation. Um, what, these, um, um, what these investigators did was use a, a well-described genetic modification of the pig. And the pig has a um, antigen called galactose, alpha-1,3 alpha, alpha galactose which humans have an, a natural antibody to because it was removed for their, from their gene uh, many uh, a long time ago, so we've developed an antibody to that. And so that, that, an, uh, that antigen would, would stimulate a, a very profound uh, reaction causing complement activation in the uterine, and that would kill the uh, transplanted uh, donor organ. Now, utilizing a knockout mouse, I mean, a knockout pig, and also utilizing a, a membrane, human membrane cofactor protein, CD46, and this is an important addition to the genetic modification of the pig. This protein basically prevents complement activation or reduces the consequences of complement activation. And also, the addition of human thromomodulin to the gene of, of the pig then actually prevents or helps prevents regulation or preventing thrombosis, microangiopathic <coughs> thrombosis. So these three genetic uh, modifications have been critical to having a uh, pig heart survive in, in, the, in the environment of a baboon. And uh, utilizing this, this, this type of genetic model has, has demonstrated safe, uh, or has, has demonstrated viability, but not life supporting function. So what, what these investigators did was three, three modifications that, that achieved long-term uh, survival. In the first group, they uh, sort of as the control group, they used a static cold preservation. So this is a technique where we just take a heart and uh, perfuse it with a cold solution, take the heart out, and uh, we implant it into the, um, into the uh, recipient. In the second group, rather than using static cold preservation, or pre preservation, they took the heart, they arrested the heart with a cold static uh, solution, and then they perfused the organ um, continuously to prevent uh, ischemia and oxygen de deprivation. And in the third uh, group, they, they, they used the um, non ischemic preservation with continuous perfusion, and they were aggressive in weaning the steroids and uh, applying antihypertensive medications and added anti-proliferative medications, particularly mTOR inhibitors, uh, in this case, temisorolimus. And what the uh, purposes of each of these uh, uh, interventions was, one, in the first uh, group, obviously, these, these, um, this group did actually did not wean or, su or support the circulation of much past weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass. In the second group, you can see those hearts survived, but only for a short period of time. And in the third group, they were actually able to achieve long-term functional grafts for up to 195 days. And the reason was that one of the important components of this was that they prevented um, hypertrophy and development of um, uh, diastolic dysfunction in the functioning graft. So with weaning of steroids, providing antihypertensive medications, and then using anti-proliferative medications uh, to prevent some of the consequences of, uh, and they have some additional effects on platelet aggregation and microangiopathic uh, thrombosis. 
um, they were able to achieve long-term sustained viability of these graphs. And using some other uh, sort of uh, uh, methods, so they use induction therapy with, with, uh, with a number of different antibodies. They weaned the steroids very aggressively. They provided anti-inflammatory therapy because inflammation, chronic inflammation, is a stimulus for rejection uh, and uh, endothelial injury. And they added some other um, anticoagulants and antiplatelet therapy uh, to prevent uh, uh, coagulation. And with this sort of cocktail, uh, they were able to achieve long-term survival. So why is that 190 days uh, important? Well, because um, if you look at the rec uh, current, um, current um, uh, sort of thought is that if you can get a graft to survive for at least three months, it meets the preclinical efficacy requirements for the initiation of clinical xenotransplantation trials um, as suggested by a advisory report of the International Society for Heart, Lung, and Transplantation. So we're coming close to re reaching uh, a metric where we can potentially utilize uh, xenotransplants in patients. And likely what the first organ to do this will be with will be kidneys. And it's very likely that we will see a xenotransplant in the kidneys within the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and that will be followed by other organs. Um, so the concern with infection, transmission of infections from animals to man has been, has been reduced significantly by development of a number of PCRs, uh, testing that can, that can span an array of infections and mycoplasms um, to eliminate the risk of zoonosis. Another um, avenue to increase um, the potential of donors is the use of, of um, C, uh, DCD donors, what we call death by uh, donation after circulatory death. And that is a, a mode of death where um, the patients actually, they're not considered brain death, but life support is removed from the patient uh, at the wishes of the family or the patient, and the patient dies a natural death. They usually end up uh, fibrillating, and they die a natural death. And traditionally, um, those donors have not been utilized, uh, those patients have not been uh, utilized for donation. More recently, uh, kidneys and lungs and livers have been utilized from, from uh, DCD donors, but not heart transplantation. In the past couple of years, there has been a now a um, real effort uh, led by uh, groups in UK and Australia to utilize DCD donors for heart donation. And the advantages of this is that there's more um, DCD donors um, every year uh, relative to brain death donors. So that um, if we rely only on brain death donors, that's going to represent a smaller portion of the donor, don, don, donor pool uh, with, with time as fewer donors uh, reach the clinical uh, definition of brain death before life support is removed. And if you utilize a DCD donor heart, um, hearts, you could potentially increase a uh, heart transplant donor pool by 15 to 20%. And this has been borne out by uh, evidence, early evidence from, from the results in, in Australia. So um, there is really two methods uh, by which um, DCD heart donation is performed. And one is called normothermic regional perfusion. Uh, and then direct procurement and perfusion. And the techniques are a little bit different. In normothermic regional perfusion, um, the <coughs> patient uh, is, support is withdrawn. The patient um, uh, suffers a uh, circulatory uh, death of ventricular fibrillation. There is a standoff period um, that usually five to 10 minutes. And then the um, once the patient is declared dead, the standoff period occurs. And then the patient, um, or at that point, um, the donor, um, their sternotomy is performed. Regional cardiopulmonary bypass is initiated after the head vessels are clamped uh, to ensure that there is no blood going to the brain. 
and then the heart is reanimated on cardiopulmonary bypass, and then um, cardiopulmonary bypass can be withdrawn, and the heart removed is similar to a, a brain death donor situation. In direct procurement and perfusion, uh, here um, the patient suffers a, a fibrillatory arrest, a standoff period occurs, and then a sternotomy and a donor, a donor cardiectomy is performed, and the heart is removed and put on a machine for, for perfusion and reanimation and assessment. And the most common way to do it is um, the second, the latter procedure. This is the, the method most, likely, most often done in Australia. Uh, the first method, um, both of these methods have been applied in the UK. Um, what has made um, the interest of, of, of DCD donors is this technology. This is the um, uh, Transmedic OCS system. Basically, this is a portable system that su supports warm perfusion to the, blood, uh, to the heart. So the heart is taken out of the body, put on this perfusion machine, and now it can be transported uh, anywhere. Uh, and it's, the heart has been supported, um, not meant to be supported for a very long time, but there's been anecdotal reports of the heart being supported up to nine hours on this machine and then, and then transplanted. So this technology can be applied in a brain death situation also and utilized to, to extend the, the reach of, of, of where we can travel to obtain a heart, but it's been very helpful in developing uh, DCD donation. And this was a, uh, at a recent meeting of the sts -EX in Latin America, in Cartagena. Uh, there was a report by the Australian group uh, on their, on their um, early DCD experience. And you can see that uh, they had 59 DCD retrievals. Uh, eventually, um, 40, uh, 41 of those were considered clinically viable, and then 28 of those hearts were transplanted, 13 uh, declined. And one of the important, the, one of the important factors is the, the circulatory, circulatory death has to occur, and the heart has to be um, uh, harvested within a 30-minute period, and that's including the standoff period. So that, so fibril and, and when the blood pressure drops below a systolic blood pressure of 50, the warm ischemic period starts, whether the patient has uh, died or not. And so that starts the clock. So if, if fibrillation doesn't occur for a long period of time after the blood pressure drops below 50, that warm ischemic period could make a DCD donor not viable for heart donation. So the patient, if life support is removed, uh, fibrillation has to occur shortly after that. A standoff period has to ensue, and then the heart has to be recovered and, and perfused within a 30-minute period. So those are one of the pra pragmatic challenges of DCD donors, and it requires a lot of, a lot of resources to do. Um, recently, the group uh, in UK reported um, by uh, Professor Messer and his group at UK reported their experience with DCD donation. And they were actually able to report on 26 DCD hearts for analysis. Um, and you can see that they looked at uh, the comparisons of the, of the, um, the donor demographics between the DCD and, and the brain death. And generally, um, they were very similar, except for the causes of uh, death in the donor, there was more hypoxic uh, brain injury in the uh, DCD hearts and more uh, um, um, intravascular hemorrhage in the um, uh, brain death donors. But then you can see that in the DCD procurement method, they use both normothermic regional perfusion and direct procurement and, and, and uh, perfusion methods to obtain their, their, um, their hearts. And you can see here, if they look at um, their survival for both cohorts, cohorts, again, small numbers, but you can see that their survival was similar between the brain death, conventional brain death donor and the DCD donors. In the Australian experience and this experience, there is a higher, uh, a higher occurrence of what we call primary graft dysfunction, meaning that 
when the hearts are recovered, they, when they're initially placed in the patient and you try to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass, there's more dysfunction and uh, <coughs> present that requires mechanical circulatory support as a bridge to uh, improvement. And so there is a higher degree of this seen with the DCD donations, but survival appears to be similar. So in the Australian experience, survival was equivalent between the two groups, but a much higher need for circulatory support in the, in the, uh, as a temporary measure for uh, primary graft dysfunction. Um, but, but, but patients were able to overcome that, the transplant recipients overcome that to a point where they had equal survival. So recently, there was a, uh, an editorial in uh, Circulation Heart Failure about the ethics of, of uh, DCD donation in, in the United States. And there's been um, quite a debate about this, about whether it should happen or not. And I think the, the forces are that, I think, within the next year, uh, possibly, or two, we'll see DCD um, donation and utilization of those heart, uh, hearts uh, clinically. Uh, some of the uh, potential um, arguments for this is that um, the Institute of Medicine has put out a lot of statements regarding DCD um, donation. Um, they have also, the Joint Commission requires that all hospitals have a DCD policy, so there's a robust experience with lungs, livers, and kidneys already, uh, and the heart heart um, donation would either either the normothermic uh, regional perfusion or, or direct uh, procurement uh, methods should be equally viable uh, as, as methods to obtain DCD hearts. Now, the list of some of these are one is um, the con against this is that reanimation of the donor heart invalidates the donor declaration of cardiac death. And there's some ethicists who believe that if you resuscitate the heart, then you've basically brought someone back to life. But um, there's ways of preventing regional blood flow to the head that so you're not animating the brain any longer. So the act of reanimation after death uh, should not signify that the patient has been brought, or the donor has been brought to a living state. Um, there's irreversibility of, of brain function after, after five to 10 minutes standoff period or longer. Um, and more importantly, if the donor wishes to donate organs, it really serves the donor's interest or the family's interest in, in going by their wishes. Um, and also, there has been clear um, DCD heart transplantation performed in Europe and also in Australia. And so I think that really um, re lowers the barrier for us to do it in the United States by demonstrating an ethical approach to, to DCD donation. The other uh, interesting development that has happened this year is the change in UNOS, or UNOS heart transplant allocation. We used to have a simplified system where we had three levels, uh, status 1A, status 1B, and status um, 2. And it has become now a really unwielding um, level, um, collection of statuses from one to six, and I'm only showing status one to three here, but there's actually six or seven statuses if you count status seven as on hold. But the most important, um, really, statuses to understand are status one, two, and three. And status one represents uh, really uh, very sick patients, patients on ECMO, um, biventricular support, or um, any, any mechanical support with life-threatening arrhythmias. Status two represents a biventricular support, um, mechanical support with a malfunction, and most um, and dis non-dischargeable VADs, so likely the constellation of, of temporary mechanical circulatory support. And then um, level status three represents largely um, patients with VADs who have developed complications such as right heart failure, device infection or device thrombosis. And if you look at, uh, these are results from um, the uh, OPT, OPTN database, uh, UNOS database. These are results for 2018. So they represent a transition period. Um, so these status 1A, 1B, 
when two represent everyone who's transplanted prior to uh, October 18th. And then October 18th, we made the transition to the new system represented on the right by status, adult status one, two, three, four, five, and six. And you can see there, by and large, that the largest number of transplants was performed for status two. And um, the next largest group was status three. And the uh, next after that was status four. Status four represents a patient who's received a durable VAD who's stable at home and doing well. So the majority of patients are two and three. And how does that likely, remember now status two represents patients that are on uh, non-dischargeable VADs for the most part. And so those are patients on short-term circulatory support who are getting, um, getting transplanted. Or it's patients in status three who are on VADs with complications. So I think we'll, we'll know more as the year progresses but it's likely um, what's going to happen is it's probably going to reduce the strategy of using a durable VAD as a bridge to heart transplantation. Because I think we're going to be less tolerant of taking a 68-year-old with pulmonary hypertension, uh, renal dysfunction, and putting them on an impella and trying to bridge them with heart transplant to heart transplantation. And I think that patient will get a, a VAD instead and then the ability uh, to transplant that patient uh, on status four on a stable on a VAD will be very low. And so by default, that patient is going to get de destination therapy. So I think that uh, durable, durable uh, devices for bridge to transplantation will likely go down. But I think what you'll see is a corresponding increase in durable VADs for destination use by default. Um, and I think marginal transplant candidates, we, the bridge to decision, those patients that have a creatinine of 2.5 and you want to put a VAD in to see if their creatinine gets better or have pulmonary hypertension and you're putting a VAD in, those patients, if they end up doing well on a VAD, it's likely you're going to be able to get them transplanted at status four. So I think by default, a lot of those patients are going to end up um, as um, destination therapy. There's been a number, uh, we'll shift from transplant now to left ventricular assist devices. There's been a number of, um, or, uh, one really important development this year uh, in terms of the devices. Um, LVADs, you know, as you know, have been de demonstrated to have significant survival and quality of life benefits, and they now exceed uh, transpl our transplantation in sheer terms of numbers. So between four and 5,000 LVADs are implanted in the United States this past year. So exceeding the numbers of, um, of a heart transplant. Um, but to really have a benefit, the, the, the therapy has to move into a less ill population of patients, but, but has been prevented so by a number of important com complications, stroke, device, um, thrombosis, and non-surgical bleeding, mucosal bleeding, GI bleeding, and epistaxis. Um, as you all know, they're, 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 the the previous device, the HeartMate 2, that was large, pretty much the, um, the device that had, had really brought LVAT therapy into the modern era, had some issues with device thrombosis. And many of you remember the report by the Cleveland Clinic and Duke Group and, and Barnes Group uh, on the accelerated uh, evidence of a thrombosis in this device. And, and part of that problem was related to the designing uh, just the inherent design of, of, a, uh, of a device where that uses a mechanical bearing. This point of um, the support, the mechanical support for the bearing is, uh, represents a point of friction and heat generation. And so it's very susceptible to causing thrombus uh, formation at that point. And if there's not adequate blood flow across the bearing to um, act as a heat sink and draw heat away from that bearing, it it, it can result in deposition of, of or coagulation of, of, of proteins and causing a nidus for thrombus. It's interesting, though, that if you look at every axial flow device that's been developed that uh, uses a axial design with mechanical pivot, each of these devices has had 
thrombo thrombotic problems. So the HeartMate 2 has had thrombotic issues. The Jarvik device has had thrombotic issues and has had to have a redesign of the bearing um, uh, in order to uh, uh, reduce the chances of pump thrombosis. The Debakey Micromed has also undergone significant design changes to eliminate uh, or reduce the risk of thrombosis. When, that first, when the pump was first introduced in 2003 in, in clinical use in the United States, it has a tremendous rate of, of pump thrombosis and underwent significant design changes. The Circulite device had significant thrombotic issues also uh, that they were never able to overcome and actually removed uh, from, the, um, from, from clinical use. And most recently, the MVAD now has been dropped for, for um, clinical use and will not be reintroduced, uh, largely based on some of the thrombotic problems that were experienced when the device was introdu introduced. So there, there, there is um, a general sense that, that a bearing design is problematic and risks uh, pump thrombosis. So what, one of the important design changes in, in the field has been the use of centrifugal pumps, and there's been two very good centrifugal pumps, the HVAD and the HeartMate 3 now, and this data represents the comparison of the HeartMate 3 and the HeartMate 2. And the HeartMate 3 uh, is, is a distinguishing device from others in the field in the sense that this is the impeller, rather than being supported by a mechanical pivot, is supported by a magnetic field, so there's no points of touching of the impeller. So it's actually free-floating in the blood and spins and rotates by magnetic, by magnetic action. And actually, the magnetic field is so strong that it allows for large gaps around the bearings so blood can freely flow around the, blood, uh, around the bearings and that there's, no, there's, there's minimal blood trauma around, around, as the blood flows around the bearing. And the other interesting um, feature of this device is that it builds an artificial... Um, what we call an artificial pulse, but essentially what it is, is it changes the RPM speed of the pulse. And the purpose of this is not to uh, design, not to create an artificial pulse so you can feel a pulse, because you, you, you may not, but the, the, this design enhancement changes the speed of blood flow through the pump and disrupts the flow of blood so that it prevents areas of stasis. So the important aspect of this design enhancement is one to prevent pump thrombosis. And so this, this trial, the Momentum 3, and, and this, these results for the two-year arm of this trial were uh, re released or uh, published this year. And it represented a cohort, a two-year cohort of 366 patients. Now the entire trial represented a cohort of 1,028 patients. And that, uh, in that cohort report, that two-year follow-up will be reported this spring. And so uh, the, the, uh, that larger cohort uh, will confirm or demonstrate other results, but um, will will provide further information uh, uh, to these results. So the study aim was a two-year study, and the primary endpoint was survival at two years, free of disabling stroke or reoperation uh, to replace or remove the functioning device. And um, except for uh, uh, the um, pretty much all the characteristics were similar. This was a sick group of patients, uh, most of the patients on intravenous inotropes. And what we saw was that um, for this group of patients, the HeartMate 2 um, or the HeartMate 3 performed better than the HeartMate 2. And that was statistically important so that the primary endpoint was achieved in 77 or 78 percent of the uh, HeartMate 3 patients and only 56 percent of the HeartMate 2 patients. Uh, importantly, when you look at the overall survival, there was a trend towards improved survival in the HeartMate 3 group, but this was not statistically significant, but we look forward to seeing the 1,000 the patient trial to see if, if larger numbers of patients in, will, will bear out this observation. Uh, another important, um, the, the risk of stroke or disabling stroke was uh, low uh, for, both, for both devices at one year. But if you look at all strokes, so non-disabling non strokes, so non-disabling strokes are essentially strokes where patients have symptoms but are able to function independently, 
disabling stroke is considered a, a stroke that requires assistance for daily activities. So that the rate of all strokes was about half that observed in HeartMate 2. So there's evidence that the HeartMate 3 device has a much uh, safer profile with respect to stroke. And I think this is one of the most important um, events, you know, observations in this trial that we're starting to make an impact on stroke. But most importantly, uh, was the freedom from reoperation to replace or remove the device. If you look at two years, 97% of the device, uh, HeartMate 3 devices, were still uh, implant, were still uh, in the patient. Only 2.8% 2, 2 had to be removed. And this is a profound um, you know, observation. Uh, if you look at prior devices, no other device has performed this well with respect to um, pump thrombosis or reasons for uh, for um, device explantation. Uh, if you look at LDH, which is a marker of blood trauma, so a higher LDH represents a higher degree of hemolysis. There was a lower LDH levels in the HeartMate 3, suggesting that this device had a safer, safer blood handling uh, <coughs> capability. And importantly, if you look at the um, rate, uh, percentage of patients that had a pump thrombosis, it was 1.1% compared to 15.7. So a, a rate of pump thrombosis 15 times less in the HeartMate 3 device compared to the HeartMate 2 device. So a pretty outstanding um, difference. And this is um, I, just to show you that INR, uh, the INR levels were similar. So the higher rate of pump thrombosis wasn't due to a lower rate of uh, INR and the HeartMate 2, and both, fun both quality of life and functional improvement assessed by New York Heart Association and Six Minute Walk were equally um, improved in both, both groups. And just shows you that um, overall, uh, equal numbers of patients were transplanted, uh, um, a little higher in the uh, axial pump group, and that's likely because more patients probably received urgent transplants for device, device um, problems. So in summary, I think the HeartMate 3 uh, is clinically superior uh, compared to the HeartMate 2, and I, I think it, it will supplant in this coming year, I think you'll, it will entirely supplant the HeartMate 2. Um, these benefits were primarily driven by a lower reoperation and a very impressive pump thrombosis rate in the HeartMate uh, 3, um, and a markedly lower stroke, and hopefully we'll see some further data with 1,000 patients as to uh, what degree of reduction uh, there really is, and um, and well, this trial was an all-comers included bridge the transplant, bridge the decision or candidacy, and DT, and and all groups had equal benefit um, from the pump. So the real the real you know the paradigm shift will is this pump good enough that we'll start moving into uh, intermax profiles that are represent left ill less ill. So right now. The majority of patients are receiving devices in, in Intermax class three and two. So the majority of patients, as you saw from the trial, uh, are are in are in are on inotropes. So in order, to, sort of the gray zone represents patients on inotropes. So roughly 70% of devices going in today are Intermax class three or four. There's been inroads into uh, Intermax four. And the question is, are these, device, are these devices now good enough to move us into Intermax 5 and, and 6? And I think time will tell. And whether we need a um, clinical trial to demonstrate that or whether we could use registry data to facilitate that, that movement into the less ill population. But clearly, I think this is the next paradigm shift in um, left ventricular cyst device therapy. Thank you.